This is Karen with NewClevelandRadio.net, and it is time for Love Letters Live with Janet Galen. Thank you. I want to introduce my guest, and I have a feeling that most people who grew up in San Francisco know this man. My guest today is Emperor Norton. And um, I'm going to go to you right away because, uh, you know, well, I do want to say one thing first. I moved to San Francisco in 1960 and fell in with, you know, a group of people and who were raised in San Francisco. And I will tell you that one of the first things they ever told me, the first thing I learned was about Emperor Norton. Oh, how wonderful. Yes. I mean, I had barely set foot on dry land myself, and I got the story of you. I didn't know the full story. I still don't. That's why we're here. Uh -huh. Until much later. So go ahead. Why don't you introduce yourself, and if you would like to start with how you came to San Francisco. You were born in England? Yes, I was born in London on February 4th, 1818. So I'm 202 years old. That's wonderful. Thank you. It's all sunscreen. Great stuff. <laughs> and and so when I was about two years old, my family became some of the very earliest Jewish settlers of South Africa in Cape Town. And so that's where I was raised. Oh, really? Now, see, I didn't know that at all until you were how old? About two years old, we got there and I left at about the age of, let me think, it was so long ago. I was about 30 years old when I left. How old? About 30. Oh, so you were well into your adulthood. Oh, yes, yes. I was a businessman <laughs> in South Africa. What did your parents do that, that took them from London to South Africa to Cape Town? Uh, just for a new start to get out of London, but also to go into the ship chandlery business. To do what? So the ship chandlery business. Those are oh, the, yes. uh -huh. all the riggings for the ships. And that's what my father Isn't did. that how Gump started? I believe so. I think you might be right about that. I'm not it positive. That's true. You're in good company. So what happened then when you came to San Francisco? You came to San Francisco as an adult, but on your own. Yes. Came here with $40,000. It's a lot of money then, isn't it? It was. Oh, yes, quite a bit. Uh, that was about a million dollars then. And um, I started making investments. Real estate, commodities. I bought three corners of Jackson and Pacific. And you I, did well. I, oh, yes, quite well. A rice mill, a cigar factory. Uh, even then, people referred to me as the emperor, <clears throat> for I was an empire builder. And then I made the fatal mistake of trying to corner the market on rice. What happened? Well, I thought I had done well because there was a rice famine in China. No exports to the United States. Price of rice is just soaring in the city. So I buy up all this rice and put it on a warehouse board. I think I've got all the rice. You put it in a warehouse or on a ship warehouse? Not on a ship, a warehouse ship. Uh huh. Because all those ships were abandoned in the bay from the people hopping off to go to the gold fields. So they oh. got repurposed for all kinds of things. And one of them was warehouses. So I have one. Okay, so what year was this? Because you're talking about gold rush and I forget that you're 225 years old. That's fine. No, this is, uh, well, I got here in 1849. Oh, and right. I lost most of my fortune by 1854, 1855. And then I tried to corner the market on rice. Thought I had it all, thought the price was going to go way up, I'd make a fortune, leveraged everything I had, other people's money, and then two boatloads of rice from Peru come sailing into the bay at that moment. Oh my goodness. With each one equal in size to what I have. So the price went way, way down. Uh -huh. And my rice was virtually worthless. What, what did you do with your rice? I mean... I unloaded it whatever I could get it for. I tried to get out of the contract to even buy it because I felt it had been misrepresented to me. I was faced with a lot of lawsuits over that, my partners, the women, who your, who, mostly lawyer fees. Who were your partners? Uh, various merchants in the city who did it on my good name and my reputation. What, what was your life like? Like, what did you do in 1849 in San Francisco just to pass the time of day? Oh, and I did stayed you in think, hotels. Pardon me? I stayed in good hotels and ate in the great restaurants and hobnob with the absolute best in town. I was one of them. Oh, so you had, you had good friends. Oh, yes, very much so. And Where did you live? Hmm? Where did you live? I lived in various hotels, uh, all 
always the best, always the best. So by 1856, I'm bankrupt. My goodness. And I disappear. Okay, wait, back up to, you, you get the word somehow that you're bankrupt. You understand that you have nothing left, probably mm -hmm. including some of the friends that you thought yes. you had. Oh, my friends all abandoned me. Oh, what did you do? Like, what was the very next day you did? That's just awful. Did anybody well, stick by you? I don't remember too well and I disappeared. But did you have any friends who stuck by you? No. And would say, let's go a couple, mm -hmm. No, I was- So you were isolated and broken and forgotten. So, so how did you start coming out of this horrible? Well, I said, I don't know where I went for two years and no one seems to know where I went for two years. Uh -huh. We have hunches, but uh, possibly Petaluma. Is it possible? But do you don't you also don't really remember where you were? No, no, unfortunately. I tried to blot those years out. I was going to say, I could see where you would have. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so I don't recall much of it. And so you don't know. Well, how did you how did you live? How did you how did you pay bills? How did you? I had I pawned everything I had, a few meager possessions. I did live with some friends in Petaluma at one point. We do know that. Oh, that's nice. Do you remember their names? Not long. Yes. And then I came back to San Francisco and wrote a proclamation. And what? I wrote a proclamation. That's okay. So now we're getting to how you declared yourself emperor of these United States, correct? Yes. yes. What, what, do you remember what you felt like? Like what made you think that you could do that? What made you feel like you were the emperor? Well, I, it just seemed like the country was in trouble, the city was in trouble, and we needed an emperor to take care of things and to make things right. Isn't that funny? That we need to be my yes. yes. And and how did you go about? I understand that you printed your own currency. Oh yes, yes, but that's a little bit late. Okay, um, well, go ahead. You talk. Lead up to that. So I, I I write this proclamation, and I walk in the offices of the San Francisco daily evening bulletin newspaper and hand it to the editor, a man named George Fitch and leave. And he decides to print it in the newspaper that evening <laughs> under the headline, have we an emperor among us? Now, as you can well imagine, if that happened in any other city, they'd lock me up. <laughs> right. We know how San Francisco is and we, we like our eccentrics. And here. so apparently we always did then, right? Yes. We, yes. And I was not the only one. There were many others. I'm just the most beloved and well-known. And so everyone treats me like I am emperor after that day. Now, that took a while to build up. But I would eat for free in restaurants. The officers at the Presidio gave me this beautiful uniform. A haberdasher gave me this hat. I added the feathers. I'd walk around town and everybody would treat me like I was emperor. I had the best seats in the theater. I could just walk into a restaurant, eat my fill, and walk out. Did you ever feel like you were scanning anyone? No, no. After all, I was the emperor. They were paying their, their due respects to me, and this is how an emperor is supposed to live. So this, this was a totally sincere personification for you? Yes. You yes. Were, uh -huh. Did you? That is, that is an interesting question, though, because the question does come up, was I crazy? Well, I didn't want to say it like that, but as long as you mentioned it, go ahead. Was that crazy like a fox? <laughs> you know what I mean? uh, my personal feeling is that I was a little of both. I truly <laughs> believed I was what I was. That's very nice, which but, is why you got to. So uh, my question is, now I went, I remember you took me for a walk one day, mm -hmm. not so long ago. I think it must have been about, what, December, January? It was definitely BC before COVID. Yes, I know that. And uh, you took me and my daughters and a few other people on a lovely walk through San Francisco. It was Emperor Norton, San Francisco. Oh yes, very much. What are some of the What are some of the places and things and incidences that you remember most vividly about yourself? And I remember, was there was there was one incident where you were not treated so we were somehow down on on oh, O'Farrell yes. oh, oh, yes. Street. The Palace Hotel. Oh, yes. What happened there? Well, I was just sitting in the lobby, minding my own business, reading the newspaper. And I guess the manager took a disliking to me and called over a police officer, a private police officer 
named Armand Barbier to have me arrested for vagrancy. Oh. I had my boarding room key. I had money in my pocket. I was going to say, wasn't vagrancy defined by how much you had to have like $2 in your pocket? In order exactly. To I had that. So he couldn't run me in for that. So instead he trumped up a charge of, uh, of involuntary treatment of a mental disorder of all things. What does that mean? I guess they thought I was crazy. Or at least he did. But the rest of the city didn't. There was an outrage. Good. The newspapers got a hold of the story and people <laughs> just outraged. And the next morning, uh, the police chief, Patrick Crowley, not only ordered me free, were the police to salute me from that day on. So that's a, a somewhat sad incident that ended up being quite good. Really? And you mentioned the currency, right? Yes. So here's an example of one right here. Can you see that okay? I can. So these were printed for me by a printer named Cuddy and Hughes uh, over by the, what's now the Transamerica Pyramid. And I would present them and they were honored by merchants. They were especially beloved by tourists coming to San Francisco because for a mere 50 cents, they could buy my autograph, which was a truly cherish. You know, I'm just thinking that you couldn't have been bad for business. I mean, where you went, other people must have come. You were kind of a draw, oh, yes, right? Very good for people. I became something of a cottage industry. I mean, I greeted people as they came off the Transcontinental Railroad in Oakland and would try to sell them my bonds. And people came to see me in the city because I got written up in tourist guides and newspapers. And, um, but also, people decided to profit off of me. If a newspaper couldn't get one of my proclamations, they'd make one up. <laughs> because those help sell newspapers. How, uh, how, did, how did you feel as emperor? How did you feel about your subjects? Oh, I felt very warm toward my subjects and that was definitely returned and still is. That's the most amazing thing. Yes, I was gonna, being back I was gonna notice that, right? You're people still here. Honest, people love to see me. Are you, are you sad that- When I presented these, these bonds, they were actually bonds. They were always uh -huh. accepted. They were never turned down. Are you a little sad that during this pandemic you can no longer take people on these walks right now? You oh, must very miss much so. Very much so. It's it was so much a part of my being to show them San Francisco, and I miss it immensely. But probably going to restart sometime very soon. Yes, you will. And you know the odd thing that I will say I noticed on this walk that my daughters and I and I, several other people there must have been about what twenty of us there. Mm -hmm. Well, is that nobody looked at you oddly? even today, nobody looked, you know, you were just a natural part of the landscape. And I think that says a lot about San Francisco. Doesn't it? Now, One let me ask. My favorite reviews I ever got said that it's fun to walk behind me to see people either acknowledge me or look away in horror. How funny. I didn't see that. Yeah. Um, Mostly I... people acknowledge me. So now when you first came here and I want mm -hmm. you, if you can't remember exactly Maybe you can kind of put yourself in that mode and say what you think it was. Okay. You came here at 30 and your parents were still in Cape Town, right? No, they had passed away actually. Oh, okay. That's sad. So they never got to see the joy of what you became. No, no. In fact, most of the family that still remains in South Africa disavows any knowledge of me. You still have family there and they disavow any knowledge? Yes, there's only one one relative that uh, is really likes to keep up. Are you still seeing me because I'm not seeing you? Something. Yes, else. I'm seeing you fine. Hang on. Well, let's just go on because I'm okay. gonna, I'm going to assume that we're That's good. That's okay. As long as everything's working, just let me know if it doesn't. Anyway, okay. there's one relative, and her name is Julie Driver from Toronto. And when she comes down here, we treat her like royalty, and uh, oh. she really just loves the whole thing, being the, the uh, grand, great grandniece of myself. Did you, did you, did you, well, you, obviously you had friends. Did you have girlfriends? Did you ever marry? I did not marry. I did have one person who was interested in me romantically and her uh -huh. name was uh, Minnie Wakeman. Uh, but I didn't know that she was promised to another. Oh. And I wrote her love letters and she saved them all. Is and this true? The Bangkok Library in Berkeley. 
Well, isn't that just so a little catnip for me? Okay. Yes, indeed. Now I did have a widow, but that's kind of an interesting story because the widow was named Jose Saria, and he just passed away about uh, five years ago. And he was the founder of an organization called the International Imperial Court. And he was the first empress of San Francisco. Wow. Well. His persona is the widow Norton. He's buried in front of me with a matching tombstone. Isn't that something? Only so in San Francisco. Tell me, tell, me, tell me about these love letters, because, you know, I always, I mean, I'm partly, I, I like it for the history. So these love letters are actually existing somewhere. Oh, yes. My handwriting is a little hard to read, but they're quite effusive. And then they become quite apologetic. That In what way? Sorry, I didn't know that you were promised to another. And if you ever change your mind, we are- Oh, in the, in the romantic way. Oh, yes, very much so. Uh-huh. So what, what, do you know what became of her? I mean, did she marry this other? Yes, she married a Colonel Bostwick and became quite prominent. And that's why her, her uh, letters, her papers, were donated to the Bancroft Library. My goodness. Now, if, if you were to write, did you write back to her as well? Not after things broke off. Uh huh. So if you were to write a letter right now, if you were to write a love letter right now, or any kind of letter of friendship or appreciation, and by the way, if you, if you were to do that even now and make sure that they get sent somewhere or they get stashed, so that also will become a part of history. Oh, absolutely. So who would you write to, given your well, whole? Well, to be honest, at the moment, I would write to the Dowager Empress. Uh-huh. And who passed away yesterday. That is very sad. And, and I would and, like, write her a letter saying how much I love her and miss her. Oh, yes. Would you ever think of writing a letter to your parents to let them know what your life turned out like? That would be a nice thing to do, absolutely. And I would hope that they would be proud of us. Yes. So how, how do you see, how do you see, I'm sorry? That, that's the royal we when I say us and we. How do you see San Francisco? Well, okay, you must have seen a lot of changes. I haven't been here oh, yes. since 1849 and I've seen changes. What have you seen as the most extreme changes between when you came and now? I would say the growth of both the financial district and the south of market area. Don't forget, I was a merchant. I was very interested in business. So I think I would be very pleased to see San Francisco become a financial uh, capital and mm -hmm. also a, a, a place for the internet to take off. And I was always interested in technology, always trying to improve things. So I would be very pleased to see what was going on south of Market Street. Some, some of the buildings that we walked past had been used for vastly different things. You know, somewhere down there, like around where, um, oh, what's the name of that restaurant? The um, Mm -hmm. what, they used to have the swings and the girls at uh, uh, Bix. Oh, yes, yes. What was that area like? Oh, well, that was the Barbary Coast. That was an That's area. That's right. I couldn't think of that. Great sin and vice. We, we didn't go there a lot. We were a very moral man. I see. We were certainly aware of it. What was your favorite place to hang out in those days? I mean, in, in 1849, there wasn't much but sludge, so I don't know what hanging out would have meant, right? Well, 1860s Montgomery Street, which is now the financial capital, was really the, the main street of San Francisco, Montgomery and Kearney. And there were many saloons and stores, restaurants. And so I, my day pretty much stayed the same. I would get up in the morning and from the boarding house I was living in on Commercial Street. I would go to uh, the boarding house next door, sometimes my own, read the newspaper. By then it was getting to be about noon, so I'd go to one of the saloons on Montgomery Street and have a free lunch. <laughs> Naturally, with your own and I would go to the Mechanics Institute, which is down on Post Street. Yes. And I would write letters, I would write my proclamations there. My goodness, when did, when did they all, because I happen to belong to that. I mean, I pay my dues annually, and yes, they have a chess club and all kinds of right. other... When did they, they go back to the 1860s, I believe it is. That's when they started? Yes. I don't know the exact date on that, but I'm pretty sure that's close. I, I didn't realize it was that long ago. Mm -hmm. they started what do you, with three what do you books. Pardon? Three books is what they started with. Wow. Yeah. 
what what do you hope to see for San Francisco from here forward? I hope that we will always retain our values in San Francisco of acceptance and reinvention. Because that's so, the thread that runs through our city's history over and over again. We're still kind of leading the pack in that area? I think so. I absolutely think so. And this is still a city where you can come and reinvent yourself and be who you want to be. And I have guess. to accept you for that. And that is a San Francisco value that I hope never goes away. Do you know other people besides yourself firsthand or as friends who came here and reinvented? Oh, many, many people, yes. And that uh, we would know? Well, people like, uh, let me think, uh, well, a lot of crab trees one. The first uh -huh. lot of fountain. She was just a little girl dancing on barrels. Became a big star. Um, well, I guess and Sally's, but you know, she, she did, did she reinvent herself? I mean, she became a madam, but. Yeah, you could say it, but then she became a politician. That's right. And then Sausalito, so she reinvented herself. Um, um, I'm, her name's escaping me at the moment. The woman on top of the... Um, oh, Lily Coit? No, not Lily Coit, but she's another good example of somebody. I know, Spre Alma Spreckles. Oh, yes. What about her? somebody who came here very poor. Is that right? A Danish family, reinvented herself as uh, an ingenue and a model and set out to marry a millionaire and got her wish and built a beautiful mansion and built the Palace of Legion of Honor. Yes. That's a San Francisco story right there of somebody who reinvented themselves. Um, all I mean, the internet I, I, people. Pardon? All those people like who started Google and Apple. And oh, I guess that's right. Yeah. The modern day version of, of course, yes. They all course. reinvented themselves and started from nothing and made it big. So, so you know, that, looking, that thread that runs through our city again. I'm, I'm looking at, you know, your, the way you're dressed and I'm thinking of, you know, brightly colorful. So I'm thinking of the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. Oh, yes, yes. There's a group that is just oh, they're wonderful, so worth just seeing in the flesh. But yeah, and that, that could not start anywhere but San Francisco. I guess that's true. Yeah. You know, I think of it as just such a normal way to live, all that we have here. Well, I want to thank you for doing this and kind of bringing us up to date on you. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here. Anything else you'd like to say to, you know, just for future or just leave it? Well, just uh, when you come here, just know that there is history everywhere. Yes. Underneath every rock, around every corner. And there are stories about everything. My analogy for San Francisco is, and its history, this city is an onion. You peel back a layer, there's another one and another one. Yes, and you know, while, while we're on the subject, I totally forgot there was the entire 60s and the hate. And, you know, there was, there is a wonderful book called The Season of the Witch. Great book. Oh, isn't that? Yes. So talk about layer after. Okay, well, thank you. You've opened up just all kinds of, not new ideas, but kind of reminded me of some old ones. Thank you, dear. Glad to do and it. Thank you very much. I, I, look, I look forward to when you can get back onto the street and take people on walks. Oh, as do I. I remember that one building with the tunnel under it. That was one of the weirdest. Oh, we lost that, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, I know that. And, you know, it's always struck me how we can live side by side with so much and be absolutely unaware of it. Yes, not even know it's there. And right. I know that leads on two more tunnels. So maybe right. we'll just go to another one. All right. I look forward to seeing you back on the street. I thank you for this. And mwah. I'll tell you goodbye for now. I'm glad to know about those love letters. Thank you so much. You know, they, they are the, like the most authentic form of history, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. When you really Absolutely. want to know something. You find people's feelings. Uh-huh, exactly. How valuable that is. All right, yeah. well, thank you, dear. Thank I you look so forward, much. I look forward to seeing you elsewhere soon. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.